All right, well, it's 5.05. This is the amount of time that I had allotted for uh, people to arrive, filter in. So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session of the Humanities Podcast Network Symposium. Um, I am leading the session. I did not organize the session, but I have stepped in on behalf of the person who originally organized it, uh, and I'm super excited to be doing so. So just by way of introducing everybody, people are going to say more about themselves when they actually get to their portions of this conference. But um, we have today, in the order they will be presenting, Benjamin Walker, host of Benjamin Walker's Theory of Everything, which is one of the founding podcasts in the Radiotopia Network, which I'm sure many people will know and love. We have Meg Wilcox from Mount Royal University. She's an associate professor in journalism and digital media. Uh, she is here from Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. Uh, I am an assistant professor at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, which is where I am right now. And we also have Carl Hartley, who is a lecturer in journalism practice at the University of Leeds. Um, so Benjamin, we'll start it off. Benjamin has just learned how to share a screen using the Zoom <laughs> functionality. So um, I assume he will be doing that now. All right, let's see. Uh, so that's the whole screen. Yeah, share. And then I go here. Ah, and then I do that, right? Oh my God, it's working. Amazing. Okay, so uh, thanks, Pierre. It's really great uh, to to join you guys for this symposium. So yeah, I host uh, a podcast, um, which is one of the seven founding shows uh, in the Radiotopia Network. And this is a network that launched in 2014. Uh, we're an offshoot of something called PRX, which is the Public Radio Exchange, uh, which is a uh, uh, part of you know the public radio ecosystem in the U.S. Um, like public radio, uh, Radiotopia shows uh, run ads. We get philanthropic uh, support, and we do an annual um, fund drive. And one of the things that a lot of us had in common uh, when we launched is that we all kind of came up together in the public radio uh, ecosystem. And American public radio uh, is, of course, itself part of America's journalistic uh, ecosystem today. In 2024, you know, we have many newspapers and magazines that now have podcasts, you know, which kind of rival what were then the mainstay of, of public radio back in the day. Um, and so what I want to do is share with you some of my uh, recent thoughts about another podcasting ecosystem, yours, which is one centered on academia, universities, and scholarship. And while I am not an academic, I think I'm the only non-academic here, uh, last year, I did put out a podcast that was more scholarship uh, than journalism or storytelling. Uh, and this was a nine part mini series that I ran on my feed called Not All Propaganda is Art. And it's a historical podcast about three writers who got caught up in the world of spies and propaganda in the 1950s. And making this uh, mini series like totally changed how I think about podcasts. Um, it really illuminated some new possibilities and questions for the form and other potential, you know, podcasting ecosystems. And that's kind of what I, I want to focus on. And I'll tell you more about the series itself in a minute. But first, to really understand this, we need to go back uh, to the birth of podcasting, which was, for me, 2004. Um, so I actually started the first version of the Theory of Everything in October of uh, 2004. I pulled this up using the Wayback Machine. Um, and it really was kind of thanks to a stroke of luck, a very classic right time, uh, right place situation. As I mentioned earlier, I, I came up in the public radio ecosystem. And in the fall of 2004, I was living in Boston and I just left WBUR, which is the Boston NPR station. And I was working with a talk show host uh, named Christopher Lydon, who was also ex-BUR. And we were both embedded in this center at the Harvard Law School called the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Uh, and I was producing some live radio shows with Chris and doing some other audio pieces uh, related to the center's initiatives on technology and civil society. But I also had my own radio show that I was doing on the side uh, and this broadcast on uh, a Boston college uh, community station, WZBC. And in the fall of 2004, I decided to turn it into a half hour show and call it Benjamin Walker's Theory of Everything. 
because my friend Roman Mars in San Francisco also had a 30 minute show that he was working on called Invisible Ink. And so I ran both shows in an hour slot in Boston, and then he ran both uh, on KALW in San Francisco. And, you know, so I, I was thinking about this radio show and at this moment at the Berkman Center was a technologist, another fellow named Dave Weiner, and he was uh, working with Chris Lydon, attaching MP3s to RSS feeds. And, you know, that's, of course, the technology that makes podcasting possible. And so on October 7th, uh, Christopher turned to me and he said, you know, you're not paying attention, Benjamin. You need to turn your new radio show into a podcast. And he helped, you know, me figure out how to create the RSS feed, and then we added it to the new podcast directories. And I know it was October 7th, because you can see also on this page I dug up from uh, the Wayback Machine. Uh, you can see there, I wrote it, uh, listen on the radio or wherever you feel like it now that we're podcasting. Um, and, you know, you, you can see that right now, but I'm sure there's something else on the screen that might be grabbing your attention and causing you some cognitive dissonance. And that is, of course, the little image of Donald Trump there. Uh, and let me explain. Um, basically, I got into radio uh, because I wanted to do both nonfiction and fiction. And this little screen right here kind of is a really great example of, of how I wanted to do that. So uh, this episode, the very second episode of, of my uh, new show, paired a nonfiction interview that I did with an author named Frances Stoner Saunders about her new book at the time on the cultural Cold War, which was a history of the CIA and modern art. And so I paired that interview with a fictional piece that I made about how the CIA in 2004 was using Donald Trump and reality television to pump out anti-union, uh, anti-collaboration propaganda into the world, all the while building up the mythical persona of the Donald. Um, so yeah, that was me um, in 2004. Um, but like I said, I really was uh, right place, right time. I want to come back to the screen and point to the radio category there. So when the podcasting explosion began at this moment, um, uh, Dave Weiner, the technologist at the Berkman Center, you know, kind of pointed out to me, he said, this isn't for you. You know, I had to make him create this radio category because he thought that, you know, we were the enemy. He, you know, we got in a lot of fights about this. Um, but I knew that with all of this buzz about this new thing, podcasting, it was going to be very good for us radio people because, you know, we had kind of an advantage in that we, you know, had experience and with craft and using audio to, to create shows. And that I felt these would stand out from the improvised live talk uh, and chat shows that were, you know, the hallmark of that moment in podcasting. Uh, and I think this is why so many of my public radio peers um, who eventually, you know, joined me in Radiotopia we're also excited uh, about podcasting. We saw it as a way to do our uh, radio show, shows we would have done on the radio if we had gotten the opportunity. Um, but we didn't see podcasting as a new form itself. And maybe I should just speak for myself, but I do recall many conversations uh, at this moment you know, uh, with a number of my peers. We hated the word podcasting and we saw ourselves uh, as radio people. And I believe some of these early, you know, efforts is what helped define podcasting as something that, you know, belonged in the journalistic ecosystem because, you know, a lot of us were coming from journalism. Um, in 2005, uh, a number of my peers, we got put into this uh, short-lived uh, NPR venture, alt.npr, um, uh, short-lived. But, you know, and even though I was doing fiction and nonfiction, you know, I saw this as a place of where I belonged. It was, you know, an ecosystem that, you know, prioritized storytelling. Uh, around 2017, a few years into Radiotopia, I kind of hit a wall with that. I realized that audiences, you know, by this point, were so uh, confused uh, in their actual lives about what was real and what was fake. They just weren't really motivated to listen to a podcast that blurred fiction and nonfiction. And I produced a multi-part mini series about that. It's called False Alarm. It ran in 2018. You can find it in my show's archives. I think it has a lot to say um, to the moment. Um, but after this, I decided to split my practice into fiction and nonfiction. I made an audio drama uh, for Audible, which is really the only ecosystem that exists, I think, for audio fiction right now. 
Uh, I made a police procedure about crime and AI. Uh, also, I think a few years ahead of its time, I would say. But it was another lucky moment for me because uh, the LA director finished recording with the actors the last day before LA locked down in March of 2020. Uh, and that, dear listeners, when I found myself uh, locked down on an island in France with my family as well, with nothing but a lot of time on my hands to think about what I wanted to do with nonfiction. So this podcast miniseries that I uh, just put out uh, earlier this year, it also amazingly connects with that slide I showed you from 2004, because back in 2004, when I interviewed um, Frances Stoner Saunders about her book about the cultural Cold War, I remember, you know, coming away from that interview thinking like, wow, there's going to be so many more books to follow this amazing thread. Uh, and I had so many more things I wanted to know. Um, and there were some great books that came out, but none of them answered the questions I had about how exactly writers and intellectuals got caught up with the propaganda networks and security agencies of the 1950s. And so during this you know, first COVID lockdown, I decided that I would do it myself as a podcast. Um, the series is actually a podcast group biography. It follows three writers who all got caught up uh, in the cultural Cold War. Uh, and I follow them from the years of 1956 uh, to 1960. And while the group biography is a standard literary form, uh, I, I believe my show might be one of the very, very first uh, group biography podcast because you know the word group means multiple characters and you know one of the basic rules of you know audio is audio storytelling it really pushes you to having less characters it's just hard for listeners to follow whereas in a book you know you can just turn to the index when you you know forget who a character is but I did it anyways um, so we're talking like nine uh, very dense uh, episodes with way too many characters. But I, I, I think I pulled it off and it's, it's something that I made that's really different than anything I've ever made before. And I kind of don't see it as journalism or even storytelling. And I want to zoom in on one of the characters in my miniseries, um, Richard Wright, to explain um, what I mean by that. So when Richard Wright died suddenly in Paris uh, on November 28th, 1960, uh, many people argued that he was assassinated. And this debate has continued um, through the decades. No one has yet to find any uh, smoking gun. In fact, many of his biographers you know, really point out and accuse him of being very overly paranoid at the time. Well, I was able to track down the audio of the final speech that he gave in Paris on November 8th, which was the day before he suddenly fell ill. And on this tape, it turns out there's a lot of extra stuff that's not in the transcript, which is in his archive at Yale. Um, you can hear him joking with the audience, making jokes about paranoia and talking about the political crisis of the moment in the Congo. This is, again, just a few weeks before Lumumba was assassinated. And you know, oh, barely a week after the anti-colonial activist Felix Meunier died, um, after he was poisoned by the French Secret Service. So you can listen to the series and then you can find out where I come down uh, on this uh, debate. But I feel the recording that I dug up and my podcast about this recording is uh, really a contribution to this scholarly debate about the final chapter of Richard Wright's life. And it's a contribution because it's audio. And I feel I've made an example of what audio scholarship uh, can sound like. Um, Another primary hallmark of the journalistic practice of podcasting is that, you know, these podcasts feature scholars and academics as guests and experts uh, who themselves might have years or decades experience with their topics and fields. But the podcaster, he or she usually spends a year uh, max working on these stories. I mean, like max. And this is why I find that so many of these uh series sound like glorified Wikipedia pages. Um, but thanks to the pandemic, uh, and an, another example of kind of luck for me, I just had a lot more time to devote to something, you know, especially all the archives were closed, you know, the university archives were just closed to everybody during those early years. 
And so I spent a lot of time doing my own primary research, you know, and plotting out my own research questions. And they took a lot longer to answer. Um, and one of the reasons was, is that I didn't want to sacrifice for story reasons. Um, and, it, you know, it just, it just took a lot of longer. Whereas I think before, and, you know, in the, in the journalistic, more storytelling framework, you would cut these out in the service of the story, which is, again, something that academics and scholars don't do in their work either. Um, it was kind of humbling to learn so late in life, you know, this basic lesson uh, that it was better because I spent more time on it. But this leads me to uh, something that will sound obvious to you, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, no one is better positioned and better primed to share uh, academic and scholarly work and research in podcast form than academics and scholars themselves. Um, I'm mainly talking here about, uh, you know, sort of short form um, work. I, I do think scholars and academics could do chat shows uh, well, maybe even better. Uh, in some instances, but I'm really focused on, you know, this sort of limited series idea and to put it maybe in your terms, like an audio version of an uh, academic book or maybe even a dissertation. And one thing I feel I have to add to this conversation as a practitioner is that there's also a huge potential when it comes to the podcasting audience um, for this kind of work. The journalistic ecosystem has been really marked for podcasting has been really marked by layoffs, uh, consolidation. A lot of the new work that's being done right now are shows that are designed to be always on, you know, more chat shows. There just isn't a business model for limited series works. Um, but when you look at what the audience wants, what they say in surveys and even the anecdotal response to the one I just put out, you know, there's just a real huge hunger and desire for stuff that has a beginning and a middle and an end. Um, so how do we build out this ecosystem? How do we get more training resources for academics and scholars so they can be uh, not just guests in a journalist podcast, but more the host and driving force of their own work? How do we direct uh, funders and universities to build this out? That's a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in right now. In fact, I have a few ventures and schemes of my own, but maybe if I've sparked any interest to chat further or uh, collaborate, um, please get in touch. Um, very easy to find. Thanks. Ah, I need to unshare. There we go. Amazing. Thanks, Benjamin. Um, let's all give a silent round of applause, those of us <laughs> who have our cameras on. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A portion at the end. So if you do have questions um, for Benjamin, um, there'll be an yeah. opportunity to ask. I assume you can also slide into the DM feature of Zoom if you want to just ask him a question right now quietly. Um, next up, we have, let me look at my list, Meg, of course, Meg Wilcox um, from Mount Royal University. So Meg, uh, take it away. There we go. I wasn't sure if it was going to let me unmute or not. But uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this evening or afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are. Uh, I actually feel that what Benjamin's talked about leads in really nicely to sort of what I want to chat about a bit today. And it's thinking a bit about podcasting as a tool for collaborative journalism and how with the advantages that we have with podcasting as a medium that we can actually start to influence journalistic practice in other ways, just like how we can look at how podcasting has influenced how radio sounds now or those other things. So let's see, um, just a little bit about me uh, so you can understand where I'm coming from when I talk today. Uh, I worked as a journalist for about a decade uh, and got into podcasting through my training in radio and working at the CBC, so the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and then got into teaching. And I still keep my foot in production. I do freelance audio production and um, some podcasting as well. And uh, in my work teaching in journalism, I'm also the co-director of our university's community podcast initiative. And basically what this is, is it's a program where we're working to connect students, particularly in journalism and broadcasting, to communities that are under and also misrepresented in traditional media. So we're looking to bring them together to collaboratively tell stories, to share their insights, and to look at different ways that we can do journalistic practice. And, you know, there's more traditional reporting as well as some options. 
So, you know, I really try to bridge academia and practice in what I do. And uh, in 2021, I started my PhD in media and cultural policy at the University of Glasgow, mostly remotely. And that's uh, sort of what I'm working on right now. And the, the photo you can see uh, just next there is actually me working with a bunch of students with the Community Podcast Initiative. One of our projects has been the Canadian Mountain Podcast, where we bring together Indigenous and settler students and faculty members to work on knowledge dissemination podcasts around research around mountain ecosystems. So we have traditional researchers as well as Indigenous experts and sort of looking at how we can change our podcasting practice to better uh, suit and work with the, the types of knowledge that we're working with. But I'll jump to my PhD for, for just a sec, because one of the main questions that I'm kind of focusing on, I would say just my research outside of the PhD as well, is what role can podcasting serve in developing more collaborative journalistic methods? Because the, the funny thing about journalism is it inherently requires collaboration. Podcasting does. You need other voices. You need other sources. If it's just you talking into the ether, you know, what's the point? Um, but as a field, traditionally, I wouldn't say journalists are particularly great at collaborating always. Uh, and this can be for a variety of different reasons in, in more traditional views of what journalism can be. And I mean, if we think about literally the history, the colonial roots of journalism, where they would send people far away, often men, to go look at something, interpret it from their own view and bring it back to where they came from, like inherently as a practice, that's sort of where it started. And so it's trickier to think about collaboration in that way. Only in recent years, I'd say, are we starting to hear terms like solutions journalism or trauma-informed journalism or community-centered journalism in, in more, I want to say, broad circles. And all of these practices are different ways that we can tackle the challenges that many identify as problems within journalistic practice. Some of them are more collaborative than others. And so these are some of the examples I'm thinking of when we think about ways we can work collaboratively with our sources. But in many ways, I'm just identifying collaboration as not deciding the story unilaterally, interviewing unilaterally, not allowing any chance for review and putting it out, which is how many people would I could or would identify journalistic practice. Of course, to do that, we first have to think um, where exactly does podcasting or uh, sorry, my connection there is that I think we can do journalism better and journalistic practice better. And, you know, if we think about podcasting as a practice, it's newer, arguably there's fewer gatekeepers, anyone can do it. Of course, that's a broad, you know, overstatement there. But there is a real opportunity, I think, to reevaluate our practice because of the advantages that and certain elements of podcasting practice itself. Of course, to identify and question how we can make podcasting practice better and influence other practices, we have to think a bit about where podcasting practice comes from. There we go. I made the connection. It took a sec. Uh, so first off, actually, Benjamin, you did a wonderful job of uh, connecting radio for me, uh, especially in the States. And we look at yeah, NPR and PRX's uh, connectors there in Canada, the CBC, uh, in Britain, the BBC. Uh, a lot of people who are working in radio were able to get into it early on, right, because uh, they already had the like the skills and the technical elements to be able to do it. And if we think about formats, particularly, I think about interview, I think about documentary. I remember seeing Ira Glass talking years ago when he actually said that the format for This American Life was heavily influenced by the documentary styles of uh, the CBC or Canadian Broadcast Company in their uh, corporation in the 1970s. So, you know, there, there's a lot of connection, you know, between radio and podcasting. More recently, I think it's fair to say we're seeing connection with film and TV as well, especially as more production companies are getting involved in more of the commercialization, I guess we could say, of, of podcasting. And uh, I think to, you know, formats such as talk show, serialized documentary, uh, we could say audio drama also was a bit of, you know, public radio, but the, the fiction is also something coming in there. And I think one of the best examples of the influence of film and TV in podcasting these days is the use of showrunner. Normally, uh, you know, in radio, you'd say someone's a producer, but in podcasting, it's pretty typical now to say that you're a showrunner, which is normally kept for uh, TV and uh, film. And then, of course, we think about, you know, the original like amateur producers uh, is, is podcasting was starting, as Benjamin mentioned, you know, in the 2004 and around then. We also look to community media and, you know, research and education, I think, is a growing area of podcasts as research uh, dissemination for research, but also uh, just podcasts as educational tools. So there's all sorts of different practices here and people might pick and choose what they like from. But I'd say these are sort of the core areas that are influencing our, our practice today.
so if we think specifically about journalism, then, you know, for for a moment, um, what makes good journalism? And I know we could have a long debate on this, but, you know, I think just like a very basic way of looking at it is we want it to be accurate. We want it to be unbiased. Uh, we can have definitions on or debates on what that means. We'd want it to be timely. We want it to serve the public interest. And generally speaking, I think we can say we don't want to harm our sources. Um, we can talk about accountability journalism being a bit differently or a bit different. You know, we think of politicians, for example, if they're doing something that's wrong, well, then people should probably know about it. Um, it might harm our source, but also it, it's accurate and in the public interest. So I think we think about any good journalism, whether it's coming out as a podcast or not, would, would have these elements. And, and it makes me think a bit about what impedes good journalism? Um, what are the excuses or rationales uh, that often come through for when things maybe aren't, you know, what we see on the list here or or we sort of miss the mark? And I think the first one that will always come through is deadlines. Well, there's not enough time. We've got to get it done by a certain time. And uh, and, and that's true. Time is, is an issue, but uh, it's also an argument, I think, for certain practices. Same with formats. If you're filing, for example, to an interview show and you actually have a really rich story that, you know, developing the context actually might involve a different way of doing it. Well, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole and your producers are probably going to give you pushback on that. Right. And and then I think a lot of it really comes down to established practice, that line of, well, it's always been done this way. And of course, when you're trying to argue to change established practice, when you're on tight deadlines and managing, you know, uh, complex stories with lots of sources, um, these are really like there are reasons why these things might not come together as, as we would hope, maybe harder to collaborate with our sources or with other people. And, you know, this is where I think podcasting is awesome because in, with podcasts, we can set our own deadlines. Many are working ahead. They're pre-recorded. You're not working the same ways to live radio formats. Again, we have a lot of flexibility with that and length, right? It's not like with live radio, you suddenly have to cut it off at the end of the hour when it's going to network for news. And what does established practice even mean as a podcaster, right? Some of us might be coming from if we've been trained in radio or somewhere else, but realistically, um, we don't have an established practice. That's kind of what this whole conference is about. So how do we look about how we could develop our own established practice and, and perhaps do better? So that's all the good stuff, I think. Um, when it comes to points of tension in collaborating with sources, and so when I'm, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about, you know, documentary work, um, working in maybe where you're centered in community and, and telling a story of a community, um, there's there's points of tension. It's not just about, oh, we can get rid of our deadlines and we can change our formats and, and we're good to go. I, I think one of the bigger discussions in journalism in general is that idea of accuracy versus bias. So you'll talk to some people who will tell you that the only way to stay unbiased, though I think we've all generally agreed now that bias is inherent in everything, is that you need to stay more distant. If you're too close to a story, that's going to affect your accuracy. And there's the others who will tell you, well, if you stay removed from your story and you need context, how the heck can you expect to be accurate, right? So it's this one that um, it depends on who you talk to, but there's always that push and pull between these things, arguing that, that accuracy is what we need, but how we go about getting it is tricky. And I think that transparency is, is really one of the best solutions to this. When journalists or producers, podcasters are transparent in their process, it allows the listeners or you know viewers to be able to decide if it's going to be accurate, like if, it, if it's true to them or if they want to believe it. And I think that's part of the reason we're seeing more success with many journalistic style podcasts, or even I, I think of true crime podcasts, the idea of you're provided you know, the, the question or the query at the beginning and you follow along in the process with the journalist. You find out who they talk to, what they're thinking afterwards, those points of reflection. And that's actually a way for you to develop trust and want to follow and, and you know, continue with that story. So I think that's great for journalism, though we do uh, need to figure out when and how we share that transparency. And of course, the bigger problem is at the end of the day, has there been a shift in power or control? The journalists are still in control and they get to decide how much, how transparent they want to be in their process if, if we're publishing it that way. So that's something that I think uh, there, there's room for growth and change. But when I think you know, about collaboration, at the end of the day, it is about this push and pull of power. It's about control and our journalists or producers able to relinquish some of that control to work with their sources, whether that's with communities or individuals in telling their story and influencing it. And I think it's really important that we start to look at ways of doing this, how we can share control. Now, of course, that's a, there's that idea of maintaining rigor. And I hear that a lot from academics as well, the importance of, of doing that. And 
I, I think there's some ways that we can do it. Some of the more common ways that I've been practicing and I know that my colleagues have been and I've read some really, really interesting stuff is options for review and feedback. And this is where some may say that there could be an influence of bias, but I do think the options of co-creating story focuses or co-creating cue lines or allowing review before publication can not only help with you know fact checking or accuracy, but also help make sure, especially if you're new to a topic that you direct it in the right way. And I think it's important to say, it's not just about allowing for feedback at the end, perhaps some guidance on say story focus, then you could continue with your, your general practice that you might as a journalist to investigate, talk to all people, do those things is still a way of doing that. Um, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is rights. So first off, um, who actually holds copyright when someone records something? It's it's the journalist. It's the person who's recorded it. And so if we think about some of these stories that are inherently personal mm -hmm. uh, that people are choosing to share with us, um, you actually technically own the copyright to that tape. And I think most of us would say, oh, we have no problem sharing that. We'll give you raw tape. We'll give you access to these things afterwards. Um, and now as there's more uses for the tape other than just this podcast, I think it's really important that we think about who does hold the copyright, the intellectual property rights for the licensing, who has access to the raw tape, and also so where that tape is stored and resourced down the line. If, you know, I've been working, for example, with um, a nation here, the Sutina Nation uh, in Calgary, and they want to be able to hold on to raw tape for their archives. And we want to make sure that that's something that they have, they have access to and, and freedom to use at any given time. And, you know, all this really comes down to, I think, is relationships, right? Like what happens after your podcast is done? You know, uh, will there be a maintaining of relationships? How does that make sense to do it? Are there potential future collaborations? And how can we we think within within that? So I wanted to talk briefly about uh, my thesis project, because this is where I'm trying to put a lot of these things in action. I uh, am doing a co-created podcast series and this is based here in Calgary, and uh, it's called Static, A Party Girl's Memoir. I'm working with Ashley King, who's a local playwright and actor, and uh, two theater companies that helped put on the play, and the play ran in September, and what we're doing is, uh, it, it's actually really cool, Benjamin, to hear about your work, because this is a mix of uh, a play, a play that's based on a true story, but each episode starts with 20 minutes of the audio drama, and then we actually move into an interview that gives more context to the real story behind it. So you can see in the description here that the, the story is mostly or the, one of the core elements of the story is that Ashley was 18 years old traveling in Bali and uh, ends up blind. Uh, she's poisoned and becomes blind and is permanently blinded and sort of how she how her life changes, how she adapts uh, relationships with her mother are a big part of this and, and sort of how she's become who she is today. And. When I first agreed to do this project, we actually didn't know if we were going to do a straight adaptation of the play or what it would be, but we just decided we were going to collaborate. We'd sort of come up with an agreement for that. Together, Ashley and I worked out the format, how we wanted to approach this. And while I've been doing the editing and the more technical side of it within it, um, it's always been a discussion as we've gone about it. This has been a chance for me to think a bit about review and feedback, how we go about it in a meaningful way. Also rights, who's holding on to it. You know, Ashley obviously has copyright to the play um, and is having control along with uh, the theater companies to actually publish and put it. So they're going to be maintaining that and I'm helping support them in doing that. And uh, a big thing that I am hoping to get into in my thesis, and there's going to be so much to discuss, I think, is the idea of um, accessibility. So Ashley is blind. She has like 2% of her vision. So how have we been able to work in what is realistically a very visual medium, right? Like at first Ashley and I were like, oh, podcasting is perfect. We're doing this for low sighted audiences. It, it evens the playing field. And then you realize anyone who's edited audio knows that trying to work around that when you say have 2% of your vision is pretty hard, especially uh, how we've adapted scripts and for her to be able to memorize and work with scripts and for us to do that as well. So these are all things that we've been tackling and trying and making mistakes and having fun with. But the series is coming out. Uh, the first episode will be next week, but uh, you have a QR code there if you want to check it out. It's on Apple and Spotify and everywhere else we've got uh, a trailer to start with. So just a few things that I've been thinking about uh, sort of in my work as, as a journalist, as a prof, as we're trying to figure out uh, not only the great things we can do with podcasting, but I also think how podcasting can provide great influence and uh, perhaps change in more traditional media outlets as well, or media ways as well. And uh, if you want some information on the Community Podcast Initiative, I've got it there, as well as a, a bit of contact info for me as well. Amazing. Thanks so much, Meg. Let's give a silent round of applause as well.
Um, so I will be presenting next, um, and it's it's great to see how all these different kind of angles are. It's almost as if they put us all in the same group for a reason. Wild. Um, so uh, I am going to, let me just make sure all my screen sharing and this thing is okay. Right, so that should be visible. Okay, um, so hello, hello again. Um, I'm now wearing the hat of a presenter rather than a V moderator. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting to be in the same lineup as as all these heavy hitters. Um, I, I've been a fan of Benjamin's work for 10 years now and teach his work at my in my podcasting courses. So it was great when I saw his name in the lineup. Um, and it's been fantastic to get to know everyone else a little more as well. I'm going to spend my 15 minutes sharing a few lessons learned from producing podcasts and also teaching podcast production in and around the context of higher ed labor organizing uh, at the University of Virginia, which is where I teach in the English department. So the kind of occasion of this presentation is a book that my students produced for which I served as podcast editor. Uh, this is a draft of the book's cover, which was designed by a student of mine named Sarah Kim. This is going to be a digital open access book, which is, I think, one kind of way we might imagine a podcast series, which normally floats on its own as being a book with an ISBN. Um, it's uh, you know freely downloadable for anybody who wants to read or listen to it. For those who don't know who's in the title here, who's not getting paid, is short for Wahoos, which is the unofficial nickname for members of the UVA community. My students came up with the title for the project. It's pretty funny in context, but it does take some explaining for those who don't know, don't know what it means. Um, so the core of this book is a project that started in a first year writing course I taught where I introduced my students to the basics of audio recording and editing and asked them to use those skills to produce a podcast series about unionized graduate student workers. Uh, so I had six graduate student workers visit my class and the students worked in groups of three to create six episodes from start to finish as a final project for the course. So we moved from a traditional academic essay to a multimodal assignment in this regard. The goal here was to have the undergraduates learn about the ambiguous and rather precarious labor category of graduate student workers. Some, some people have, have been in that category themselves. Um, and most of my students have interacted with these this category of worker as TAs, but only as TAs. So this podcast project was kind of a structured opportunity to start a conversation. Um, this is a clip from one episode that kind of illustrates the in-betweenness. Frustratingly, talking. graduate students live this duality where it feels like every time we try to bargain for better rights or compensation, we're told, oh, your students, you should be grateful for what you're getting. But when we decide, hey, like, you know, this is unfair, I'm not going to TA for this. They're like, oh, that's your job. You can't say no. And so in that sense, there's a dual existence. So this gives you an idea of the content and kind of the texture of these conversations. It was only after the semester ended that the podcast series went from a curricular project to an extracurricular one. I was telling another faculty member about what my students were up to and showed him some examples. And he suggested it was of, of a high enough quality that the podcast project might work for an academic series that he was editing. So over the past two years, this started in the fall of 2022, I've been working with a cohort of seven students. Um, these guys, uh, to kind of refine the project such that it was of this, you know, sufficient quality to be published by a peer reviewed academic press. There are two zones of best practice that I've been thinking about for the purposes of this presentation, and they kind of overlap in the story of this student-created podcast project. So first there's frustrating. No, do that. Um, first there's uh, what I'm going to call community-engaged pedagogy. So this is something Meg obviously is thinking deeply about, where students' learning outcomes involve not only acquiring concrete academic skills, but intervening in the world outside the classroom. And second, there's a related question of how to teach into and around and about live political issues. I'm going to suggest applying the framework of civic literacy that I'm borrowing from the cultural critic Henri Giroux. Um, the funny thing about teaching, as some of you will know, is that nobody really knows what's happening in the classroom except you and your students. So in sharing these stories, I'm hoping to highlight not only a pedagogy I've, I've been working with, but, but also the work that my students do. Um, I'm, I'm proud of them. I think it's great work, even before, um, you know, this publishing opportunity came across us. Um, I, you know, I thought it was really great work. And, um, you know, you, you have these little, these relationships, these little communities you build, and then 
you make something great and then it all kind of disperses. So that's that's one reason why I thought it would be worth um, trying to participate in this conference. Um, I've taught a number of writing courses in which students have engaged with the world outside the classroom, especially with labor unions in the Charlottesville area. This is an interest of mine. Um, and my view basically of teaching writing is that you can't really separate learning how to write from learning why to write. Um, the college essay is not a form that exists in the wild and my students kind of know this intuitively. So I try to place my students in direct contact with the world, which is something Joseph Albers of Black Mountain College like to say. This is Albers teaching photography in the community cabbage patch at Black Mountain College, probably during World War II. Um, like I said, the college essay, not a form that exists in the wild. It can feel as though you're kind of just going through the motions. So what are the real world stakes? Um, there's this abstract good, uh, if you're a student who cares about this sort of thing, of developing your skills of verbal expression, but it can be a lot to take on faith, especially when you're being asked to go through another, yet another round of edits on an essay. So what is the point? My answer to this question has been to focus on the public aspects of writing, especially as used as a rhetorical tool by the labor groups we're working with before we even uh, got involved. So the podcast, I think, is a powerful example of, of one way that writing can be used as a form of advocacy, and that's the conversation we're stepping into. So a few years ago, I helped produce a podcast series for uh, CWA, Communication Workers of America, Local 2265, United Campus Workers of Virginia. And this is an example I shared with my students to kind of frame our inquiry. What are we doing here? How are we stepping into this conversation? As you can see from this nice logo, uh, the podcast was called Talking Union, and it featured unmoderated conversations between union members from different parts of the university. So graduate student workers speaking with faculty, undergraduates speaking with postdoctoral staff, for example. The idea was to create the sonic equivalent of what's known as wall-to-wall -wall labor organizing. So many unionized workforces have different bargaining units for different shop floors. In Charlottesville's public schools, for instance, there are separate unions for teachers and for support staff. They are part of the same local, but they have different contractual uh, bargaining kind of um, units and, and outcomes. In a wall-to-wall -wall union, by contrast, anyone who receives a paycheck from the worker or workplace, in this case, UVA is eligible to join. So that includes student workers, faculty, staff, subcontractors like dining hall workers who are technically employed via Aramark, but nevertheless employed under the UVA umbrella. There are benefits to both forms of organizing, but the way United Campus Workers organizes is all about challenging distinctions between different classes of worker and suggesting that these workers may have more in common than they might think. Uh, and as I explained to my students, that's what we were trying to highlight with the Talking Union podcast through the form itself. There are no intermediaries. There are simply two people in conversation on the basis of their shared experience. So I'm going to share a brief example of a staff member in conversation with an adjunct professor. Uh, Julianne, the adjunct professor, speaks first. So here we go. Our daycare for two kids was more than half of what I make. You know, so... Uh, and, and I know some of the pushback that I've gotten when I've brought this stuff up is, well, you, you chose to have kids. I absolutely did. And I would choose it again. Um, however, going back to your point, if you want me to be the worker that I know that I can be because I'm passionate about what I do and I care about what I do, then why are you not supporting me in other aspects of my life? I'm not bringing my whole self anymore. I'm bringing an exhausted, burnt out, bare minimum version of myself. Well, and when you say to women, you know, you chose to have kids, so why do you expect to be so supported in the workplace? <laughs> You're not talking about some kind of lunatic fringe of people who decide like, oh, maybe I'm going to do this crazy, you know, thing and have kids. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of people. You're talking about a huge percentage of your workforce. You know, you can't, you can't like pose this existential question as a, as a sort of <laughs> rational argument, the existential question, why, you know, well, you chose to have kids. Well, well, yeah, but I mean, so do a lot of people, uh, yeah. you know, are we supposed to drop out of society? Because that's, that's what you're begging us to do. Yeah. Uh, All right. So that's a little bit of the podcast. Um, the invitation I made to my students basically was to say, let's, let's conceive of your podcast, the thing you were going to make as a space in which you might similarly attempt to start a conversation across a certain amount of distance in the space where you're all coexisting. The, the podcast is a form that lends itself to this inquiry-based mode of writing rather than an argumentative one, I think. And, and additionally, approaching these interviews as two-way relationships also invited a degree of reflexivity that proved to be quite humbling in many cases. Nearly all of my students had teaching assistants in that semester's classes because first-year students in college take a lot of large lecture courses. 
So this was an invitation to re-examine some of their own assumptions about this category of worker, um, kind of seeing themselves through the eyes of these TAs. You can hear a little bit of that in this interview with Stephen, who was a philosophy grad student at the time, as well as an adjunct instructor at a nearby community college. Our mission, our goal is to say that it's not okay, that it's not acceptable, yeah. that, you know, especially during COVID, this, this kind of made it really visible. You know, it's not acceptable that the people who are making the university run right. are the people that are least valued. Mm -hmm. So who was here? when students weren't here. Well, people who work at the hospital were here. Mm -hmm. People who clean the bathrooms of the dorms when students came back, those people were here. Those people were risking their health. You know, those people were doing their job to make sure that the university existed. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we started having classes online, when we started having classes even back in person, most of those classes were run by grad students or made, uh, the grading was done by grad students. So he's gentle here, but he's, he's firm, you know, he's very clear about what he believes, but he ultimately leaves it to the students to kind of locate themselves in the structure he's describing, which brings me to my second major point here. My view is that the podcast forum makes for a valuable pedagogical and interpretive tool because it places students in the position of authorship and gives them the responsibility and privilege of constructing meaning from evidence. So I'm going to bring in two quotes that have informed my thinking here. The first is by Chioke Ayansen, many of whom, uh, whom many of you will have heard of. He's the force behind the Resonate Podcast Festival, which has kind of become a huge piece of the American, at least the podcast landscape. Ayansen has said, there can be no critical thinking without media literacy and the best thinkers are makers. And when I first heard this formulation, it kept kind of rolling around in my head because it struck me as so intuitively true. If you want to understand how something works, you should take it apart and put it back together again. It's how I learned to fix my copy grinder. Uh, it's also how I learned to tell stories. You take these two things, you connect them and suddenly you have this weird movement that we call meaning. And I think we can go even further than media literacy as I've increasingly found my footing as a writing teacher, I've come to define my goal not just as literacy, but as what Henry Giroux calls civic literacy, the ability not just to read text, but to read one's own story into continuity with the political. And Giroux puts it, I think, really beautifully here. Students need to be inspired and energized to address important social issues, learning to narrate their private troubles as public issues. Private troubles as public issues. The, the word narrate there is the fulcrum of the thought, for me at least, because it suggests the way in which the how and the why of writing are connected. What am I teaching my students if not to make sense of a lot of different contradictory stories about what college is for? One interesting thing about these conversations between my students and these grad student workers is that my students often found their way to levels of abstraction and technical detail that simply would have been boring or conceptually daunting if they had tried to start there. So here's another clip, the last clip of my students talking to Shalmi, a PhD candidate in the English department. And for those who don't know, uh, Governor Youngkin here refers to Glenn Youngkin, who is the current Republican governor of Virginia. Briefly, the Board of Visitors is this administrative board that is appointed by Governor Youngkin. And every university has one because we're a, pro we're a public school. What the BOV does is they are the people who kind of administer everything at the macro level of the university. So budgeting, the Board of Visitors sets the budget. Building new construction stuff, Board of Visitors. You guys pay rent for your student accommodations, Board of Visitors. They are immensely powerful. And this is like a board of people who have no actual, they are mostly businessmen, businesswomen, I guess political donors, because they're appointed by the governor. There is stu student representation and faculty representation on the Board of Visitors, but they are non-voting. So there's one student member and one faculty member. I wouldn't have Board of Visitors. That, that's a very like US thing. That's not how other universities, I mean, from my experience in India, I also went to a public school. That's not how it's run. The university admin is made up of people who are actual stakeholders. So, you know, a little choppy, it's a student podcast, but but the thing that I like about this is that, you know, you can see by choosing to include this clip, my students were indicating how they had sort of traveled upward in the hierarchy of meaning from these concrete questions about what someone does all day to these more complex abstract ideas, because you can't understand labor conditions without understanding who calls the shots. So the most surprising and rewarding thing for me was that by the end of the semester, my students seemed to care actually about how the university worked in a way that I don't typically find at least first year students do. And I think it is in some ways attributable to having their got their their fingers dirty, having gotten their fingers dirty, uh, so to speak. Um, that's more or less- 
what you'll hear in the book, these sort of six encounters between students and grad student workers. Um, and by way of a closing note on be best practices, since that's the theme of this conference, I just wanted to emphasize that a project like this one, despite sort of being closely involved with a labor group in a way that, as Meg indicated, might be construed as compromising, uh, you know, introducing a level of bias, it doesn't require students to endorse the tactics or goals of their interviewees. What I'm asking them to do is simply to understand those tactics and goals. The students finished the semester or this book project and went off and believed whatever they wanted to believe. But I think one hesitation we might have in getting too close to a live political or activist cause is that it might compromise neutrality, if that's something that we value um, as a reporter or a writer or a teacher. But I think that when you or your students accept the responsibility of authorship, of being an equal partner in dialogue, you're giving them nothing more or less than the opportunity to argue on the level of the evidence. Um, and I think, you know, the, the the notion of civic literacy for me is a nice way of framing, you know, what you get when you're actually able to step very close to uh, the intricate functioning of something as large and complicated as a major research university. Uh, so that is all I've got. Thank you for listening. And um, we are, I think, five minutes behind schedule, but doing great in terms of morale. Uh, and so last but not least, we've got Carl, and then we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. So Carl, take it away. Thank you very much, Piers. And can I just give you a round of applause as well um, for that? It was really, really interesting. So thank you. Um, right, I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, you should be able to see that. Can everybody see that? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so my name's Carl. I'm a lecturer in journalism practice at the University of Leeds. Um, I teach broadcast journalism, and that includes uh, podcasting. Uh, I, don't but... to, I don't want to interrupt your flow too much, oh, but no. I'm seeing on the screen a black rectangle that's partially covering your... Oh. You seeing this, or is it my... Um, let me have a look. I see Carl, it too. That, that might be your Zoom toolbar. Sometimes okay. a zoom toolbar, you just need to move the zoom toolbar either way at the top or way at the bottom. Bear with me a second. I've lost the screen now. Um, sorry about this. Oh no, you're fine. I thought we should we should sort this out as soon as possible. No, it's better to yeah to sort it now. Then I just can't even find the zoom screen now. It might help to unshare and then relocate the... Yeah, ah, there we go. Okay, and then if I just share it again, yeah. Let's give it a try. Is that better? I move that? Oh, no, it got bigger. Oh. That better? I'm... Oh, there it is. It's gone. Gone? Yes. That's... Okay. So I just All right. To... I think you should take it from the top. <laughs> yeah. That's good. To you. Now that we've sorted this out. We can edit this bit out. So yeah, that's, that's true. Cool. That's the magic of, of digital media. Exactly. Okay, here we go. So my name's Carl. I'm a lecturer in journalism practice at the University of Leeds. Um I, well, I'm going to be talking about the sound of politics, which is a podcast. It's an academic podcast, um, but it's about how politicians sound and how they communicate with uh, the public. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background about me and about um, Professor Stephen Coleman, who hosts the podcast that I produce. So I uh, teach broadcast journalism, which includes uh, podcasting. Um, I've been teaching, this is my third year at the University of Leeds, um, but most of my career has been in broadcasting, so I've worked in radio as a manager, presenter, producer, journalist and news editor for 24 years. And I still work in industry as well. So I work at BBC Radio 5 Live. So I read the news there and do some production shifts as well, um, which keep my skills current um, within what I'm teaching. And my career has seen me work at commercial radio stations, also at national broadcasters like Talk Sport, which is a radio station that obviously covers a lot of sport, but um, is across the UK. And I've worked at both local and national BBC as well. Um, 
Stephen has worked in the university um, studying political communication and um, research in political communication for nearly 40 years now. Um, he started off at Oxford University and moved to Leeds nearly 20 years ago. And we kind of decided to do this podcast because it brings together everything that Stephen's got to say. So all the research that he's done over the years that he's been researching and my industry skills in terms of the technical side of it and the way that, you know, you can communicate through audio. And we wanted to reach a wider audience. It's a bit of a theme that has come through from all three of the guys before us who've been talking about getting our information out to a wider audience. And that is what we want to do with the um, Sound of Politics. So why did we choose a podcast? Well, the popularity in podcasting is growing, as everybody will know who's here today. Um, figures show that... Um, in the US, in the UK, and around the world, more people are listening. There's around 545 million people listening to podcasts. And the forecast as well is that by 2027, more than 650 million people are going to be listening to podcasts. So we thought it's a great place to be. We've got our communication skills as well. So we wanted to do this podcast. We also saw that there was a rise in podcasts that sharing political opinions, um, some were not always accurate and we wanted to get into the space where we could offer um, factually checked out, researched information, but we wanted to put it in the place where, you know, people who maybe were getting dis and misinformation, we wanted to be in the same place as them. And then, you know, podcasts are accessible, they're flexible, as has been mentioned already in this panel today. And we could go into longer and more in-depth discussions in our podcasts as well. So that's why we chose to do a podcast. So when it came to deciding, you know, what we, you know, how we were going to tackle this podcast, we started off thinking about our audience. So we wanted to aim at an academic audience, but we also wanted to open it up to more people. So we needed it to be accessible. We needed to think about the format as well that we were going to do it. I come from a radio background, as Meg was saying earlier, you know, there's a lot of formats within radio where, you know, you're hitting junctions, you know, you've only got three or four minutes to do an interview and get the information out. But we wanted to be able to spread it out, but we wanted a format that was inclusive as well. So this was the thought process when we were putting the podcast together. Um, we had to decide what platforms we were going to use. So, you know, thinking about iTunes, Spotify, Podbean as well is one of the platforms that we use. But again, we didn't want it just to be internally at the university. We wanted it to be to a wider audience. And considerations in terms of guests as well. Um, so the podcast has a lot of politicians on. We have a lot of scholars, but we also get the general public involved as well. So we do a lot of Vox Pops on the podcast. We um, plan to go out and speak to people and get questions for the politicians when they're coming in, um, questions for the scholars as well and the academics who come on the podcast. So we kind of include the general public because we want them to be involved and we want them to, to help lead where we take the podcast. And then we're thinking around the ethics as well. Um, as many of you know, there's no specific regulations around um, podcasting that you would have with broadcasting, in particular in the UK with Ofcom. Um, but we had our own ethics. And the main thing we wanted to make sure is that the podcast is impartial. We wanted it to be open up to whatever party, whatever views you have politically. We didn't want to take sides. Um, also, the name was a big thing for us and the imaging. So the sound of politics, that basically does what it says on the tin, really. Um, we're looking at the sound of politicians, the way that they communicate. And the imaging was a big thing for us as well, because uh, nowadays when you're searching for a podcast, the first thing you see is the image. So um, if we see, if we just flick back to the start, there you go. It's just basically says exactly what it is um, when people find that image. And promotion was something we spent a long time talking about as well. Um, we didn't want to just launch with one or two podcasts. We wanted to build up a significant body of material before we started doing big promotions for the podcast as well. So we built up a few episodes before we launched it out there because we felt that 
that would allow more people when they came in and we introduced them to the podcast, they could listen to one, but there'd be more than they could listen to two or three. Um, and we've started to increase that now um, by doing conferences, everything that we do. Um, we make sure that we promote the podcast when we're doing it. And we've also got ourselves on podcast radio as well. Um, which goes out in the US and in the UK. And when that happened, we saw a spike in our listener figures. So as I've mentioned, you know, we had a lot of things to consider before we launched it, but we narrowed it down to impact, informative, inclusive, and trusted. They're the four things that we really want our podcast to be based around. And when it comes to impact, it's getting people thinking and getting people talking. Um, we want it to be memorable. And to help with that, we looked at the imaging, the jingles, and the scripting as well, making the scripting accessible using conversational language um, that would, you know, every everyday language that people would use. And um, with our jingle, um, we've made it that the sound is always the same, but we put um, political clips into the jingle to allow people to um, hear what we're talking about. And what I mean by that is, so when the US election was on, um, we were having clips with Trump in there, um, Kamala Harris, um, Joe Biden as well. So we changed the jingle up depending what we're talking about in the episodes, but the sound of the jingle will always stay the same. And here's just an example of this. His backbenchers say it's embarrassing, your words. Is everything OK, Prime Minister? Prime Minister! Well, Mr Speaker, I, I tell you what's not working. It's that line of attack. Right. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. And I want you all to know that we are fighting the fake news. It's fake, phony, fake. The Sound of Politics with Professor Stephen Coleman. So it will always be the same sound, but different clips, uh, depending um, what we're going to be talking about within the episode um, or the series of episodes that we're doing. Um, I guess, as I say, we like to get politicians on. We like to get academics on as well, uh, discussing what's going on. And we want to inform the audience and we want to be inclusive as well. So as I've said, it's an academic podcast, but we want that wide appeal. Um, so we think about how we explain certain things within the episodes. You know, so if something is complicated, we break it down. Um, so then the audience understands what we're talking about. And the key thing, as I say, is trust. Stephen explains how he and all the guests have come to any conclusion, any conclusions that they make. So like Meg was saying, you know, breaking down how we've come to what we believe is right. Um, so then the audience can make their own decisions. So there's a lot of advantages to podcasts. Um, you know, they are accessible, easy to listen to, flexible. You can listen when you're going to work. You can listen when you're doing the housework. And that's one of the positives of a podcast. You find that audiences are loyal. Um, podcasts are quite intimate. So there's a lot of trust and loyalty with the audience. As I've mentioned, and as others have mentioned on the panel, you can do longer and more in-depth content. So with radio formats, you've got the junctions that you're getting to, the traffic and travels, um, and the gatekeepers there as well, the producers. You don't have to go through them, which is a good thing for podcasts in that sense. And there's no regulations. But what comes with that are the issues, you know, in terms of blind loyalty. You get the echo chambers, people listening to views they already agree with. Um, so we have to be careful of that. And also the lack of robust challenging and checks that um, in some podcasts that are there and the audience are just listening to that. And they're listening to the views of the, of the um, presenter and, and the guest, and they're not being challenged, which leads to more misinformation and disinformation being put out there. And, you know, I can see this, you know, if you listen to the Joe Rogan and Donald Trump interview um, recently, there was no real challenging from um, Joe Rogan in that one. And now if we look, you know, everybody's talking about whether both elections in the UK and over in the US um, were podcast elections. Well, podcasts did play a massive part in, in both. 
Um, the UK saw an increase of 50% or more downloads during the 2024 election, according to some of the publishers. And the BBC registered its second busiest week on BBC Sounds during, during the UK election. They don't actually tell us what the busiest week was, but I imagine that would be around the Queen's death. Um, and the latest figures as well from the BBC say that the US election has pulled in big numbers. So it just shows that people are listening and getting their information around elections from podcasts. But as I pointed out, Joe Rogan endorsed Trump. His interview gained or his podcast gained over 400 new uh, 400,000 new followers. But when they looked into what was being said, there was at least 32 false claims from Trump. And I find that worrying. You know, I feel as journalists um, in, in the mainstream media, hopefully you would hope that the journalists would have challenged those um, false claims. So I think it is something that we need to just keep an eye on. So as I round off this bit, um, I think the future of political podcasts, um, they're going to continue. Um, podcast popularity is going to continue to grow. Um, I see that younger people are engaging with this form of audio and getting their information from here. I think more politicians are going to seek out podcasters for these friendly in interviews. Um, they're going to be less robust, so they feel more comfortable um, being interviewed on there. And I think more businesses are going to move into this space as well. Um, it's already and moving away from the grassroots into more of a business. And I think political podcasts with big numbers could be taken over. And where does that leave impartiality? That's something I think we have to look at. And where does that leave regulation? Do we need regulation? Do we not? Um, I think that, again, is something that, you know, in the future we need to be talking about. And I think finally, what I would say is, um, as creators, as researchers as academics i think we have a responsibility to make sure that our content that is being checked that is research that is challenging i think that needs to be as accessible as possible for audiences and we need to get our podcasts in the places where those audiences are listening and that's my podcast today and there you go you can have a listen to the sound of politics if you want by using the qr code um, and if you've got any questions as well you can drop me an email Amazing. Thanks so much, Carl, um, and for, for the work you're doing. Um, so I've been told, special dispensation, this session ends at 6.15, but I think we can go a few minutes over if we need to. So if there are any questions, um, please do let us know. I believe um, we will be able to unmute you if you would like to ask your question verbally, or you can drop your question in the chat where we will all be able to see and respond to it. And uh, let's um, let's see if we've got any questions. I mean, do we have any questions for one another? Oh, there goes there goes Joe with a raised hand. Let me see if I can. I think I can unmute. That's all right. But I, if you have questions for each other, I'm happy to let you go first. I'll go for it. I'm just curious. I, I work in um, podcasting at a, at a university, among other things. I work for a, a unit that tries to support faculty um, using media as part of their um, research and pedagogy and scholarship. Um, and uh, one of the things I'm thinking about now as we try to develop a new show is um, I'm curious to hear from, from, from all of you who have some background in journalism about um, the question of, I, I, it seems like in journalistic productions, um, because there's limited time maybe, and also because of storytelling and trying to hold attention, we often talk about research as sort of a one dimensional thing. Like what does the research say about whatever the topic is? And that's one of the things I'm finding challenging or a challenge I'm really interested in in academic podcasting is trying to hold the nuance that actually for almost any topic, the research has competing strands of thought. So like in education, you know, one of them might be like the, the reading wars. And so, you know, I've heard examples of podcasts that say, well, this, the, this science says reading works like this. But if you dig into the research, there's not one answer in the science. There's a big debate in the field 
but that's hard to make um you know entertaining uh if you're trying to engage with a broader audience who's not necessarily going to do the whole lit review on every topic so um just something i'm curious about if you've encountered something like that basically a question of trying to maintain nuance but um editing things down for a broader audience it's a great question does anyone feel like they might be able to field that one I, I can take a stab at the start. Uh, I actually think it's it's that that tension in the competing strand of thought that makes it interesting as a podcast, right? Maybe not having one person narrating and explaining it all, but maybe having another person to bounce off saying, oh, I've been reading about this and there's this, here's another view about it, right? To sort of dive a little bit more into the process. I think um, the general assumption and I've been really bad with this as uh, as a journalist, is we try to say it the fastest possible when really with podcasting, if you do it in a, in a compelling way, thinking the opposite, taking twice as much time as you normally would, but finding a way to make it interesting to either bring in other voices or sounds as you bring in these concepts will absolutely maintain people's interests. I think the bigger challenge um, with audio is when we're doing academic citation, like what's a way of doing it that is compelling to still listen to and not break it up like reading APA style or something like that, right? Um, making that a bit easier to say so it's not a mouthful of words and, and names and years. But I, I think that, as you've pointed out, the tension there, the debate or the competing strands is actually what could make it really interesting in the discussion. And I think um, one of the great things about, say, lit reviews, are you doing the lit review so a listener doesn't have to, is you're doing the heavy lifting, but they get to benefit from all the information. And I think that's why a lot of people listen to podcasts. I think gonna, the only thing. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Benjamin, you go first. No, no, no. You, I was going to ask a here's a question, but go ahead. Now, all I was just going to add, and it's not quite with um, reviews, lit reviews, but in terms of with our podcast, um, the sound of politics. What we do is when Stephen's explaining a concept or um, something that it is quite complicated, we'll find examples of that and put the clips in. So when we're talking um, about the way certain politicians communicate, we're dropping those clips and examples of that in. And I suppose that's a way of just bringing it to life in terms of that. I mean, it might not work for every aspect or every podcast that, you know, or every matter, but um, I think it's something to think about. Uh, so yeah, I, I have a question for Piers, but I'm thinking it might be so more U.S. Uh, specific. Um, uh, you know, it just it, you know the, the university situation is just different in the uh, America versus uh, uh, the U.K. and Canada. But I, it seems that like with this amazing work that you shared, uh, Piers, it you know when it comes to university support for these kind of ventures. Um, you know, if we look at what happened in Florida this last year, you know, with DeSantis and, and, and you know, how difficult life has become for uh, professors and academics. Um, and, you know, this work you're doing is also, you know, do, do you see that the university might, you know, sort of cut support for these? Or and I guess my better question is, is it possible to imagine, you know, support coming from outside the university for ventures like that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think I think a lot about this. Um, UVA is, you know, the flagship university of a purple state. Um, but I think um, how things are going to play out in the remainder of Governor Youngkin's term, where the Board of Visitors has new appointees each year. So in July, it just rolled over to a majority uh, Republican appointee Hopefully this isn't too boring to people in other countries, but, um, you know, majority of Republican appointees after having had a Democratic governor beforehand. And so you're already starting to see policies changing, both sort of formally and informally in terms of like, in September, um, the university announced an official position of neutrality on all current events. They're not going to comment on any events of any kind so as not to create a precedent where they have to comment on other things. Um, and, you know, like there's a really great, I mean, Hari Kunzer has this amazing article in uh, Harper's, a few Harper's is ago, looking at how Penn, and this won't be news to Benjamin, but um, how Penn, uh, the, you know, foundation, uh, PEN responded 
to the rise of fascism in Europe, in Italy and Germany. There was this official position of neutrality that was adopted, um, which meant that, um, you know, uh, in retrospect, uh, they miss an opportunity to take, in many cases, a sort of powerful stand against um, the various fascist governments that arose. And so I think, you know, all that's to say, when you start to articulate positions that can be construed in some way as leaning any kind of way, um, you're sticking your neck out. People in my department are getting FOIAs from conservative alumni groups asking for their syllabi, which then these groups are, are tweeting out um, as a way of just bringing the you know collective hatred of the internet down, a certain corner of the internet down upon hardworking, low paid um, university professors. And, and this trend of doxing and harassing is like, it's a playbook now, like it's happening everywhere. Um, it's in, in Florida, you know, it's, it's become institutionalized in a way that it hasn't yet in, in Virginia. But it's a real question. In this particular case, the book that I've published is through a, you know, a press that's not affiliated with the university. It's, it's a nonprofit um, academic press called Parlor Press. Um, and so I'm, I'm aware that well, in this particular case, it's a it's a it's a fairly safe thing to do. But but by being in any way associated with um, causes such as that of organized labor, I, I think it is it's a real question. And I so far haven't. I, I will say I went from being a lecturer to being an assistant professor um, recently, and so had a much less. Uh, I didn't feel I had as much to lose. Now that I have a real job with a sort of long term contract, I do feel myself wondering a little bit. Like, well, I wonder. Um, you know, I wonder if this is still such a good idea, but, but I do think like, if you approach it from the standpoint of saying, I am not teaching my students to become labor activists, I am introducing my students to labor activists that they might not have had a chance to meet otherwise. And if what you take away from this is a reaffirmation of your belief in Milton Freeman and like, you know, the notion that like the freest markets are the best markets, you have more evidence to support your view. And I, I think like I've had students who push back a little bit. Um, and and I think that if we're talking about developing students as writers through this process of engaging with issues outside the classroom, I think those things are totally, you know, you can totally balance them. Um, and I don't feel as though, as much as I care about the issues that these activists are, are um, trying to try to argue for, I also care about my students. And, and that means caring about them in all the sort of contradictions that they have and all the ways we might care to define diversity. So that's a very long answer to the question, and um, the. Yeah, I, I want to follow up with you on that later, but I'm I'm sorry, I forgot I have to pick up a child, so I have to run. Uh, I thought, you know, I, I remember. Yeah, I have to be there at six thirty, so that's like ten minutes. I'm going to be already late, so let me. I'm going to have to run. Thanks for your presentation. Um, all right, so um, that's a uh, that's a great question. Do we have any other? I see uh, Milan. You have a question. Would you like to? Unmute. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I was actually only able to join for the last two, so I'm going to uh, listen to the others uh, when they're released, uh, the recordings. But um, so if if part of my question has been covered in the earlier presentations, I apologize. Um, I wanted to actually ask partly you bring up doxing and harassment. Um, I wanted to ask about questions of sort of uh, anonymity and protecting speakers, um, maybe also kind of protecting yourself as a creator of, of political podcasts. Um, you know, there's clearly like uh, a need for that sometimes. Uh, this, on the other hand, there's a kind of credibility that comes from putting your name and publicly um, uh, making yourself visible. So yeah, I just, I, I wanted to hear more about each of your reflections about that and maybe also a more kind of radical thing that has been on my mind is like should we publish every podcast that we make is there a place for a kind of podcast that might only circulate privately within a certain community but not kind of on podcast platforms not on the internet um so anyway just curious to hear all of your thoughts about uh the value and the limitations of of going public that's a great question. I mean, I feel like we all have really different relations to this. Carl and Meg, I mean, how, are, how do you think about that question? I mean, the communities and, and kind of questions you're engaging with are, are quite different, but I imagine you have thought about this in some form. Do you want to go first, Carl? And I mean, you're working on a political podcast, so. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the work that we do is, is well researched. Stephen spent so many years um, researching it. So we're confident that what is there, we are happy to put our name to. But again, Stephen's been at the university a long time. We don't. So it is a podcast that comes out of the university, but technically we're doing it separately, so similar to what you were saying, Piers, as well with your book. Um, it is, you know, we can kind of cut ourselves off from the university in that sense. But because we, because it's so well researched and because we believe in what we're actually saying, then we're happy for our names to be there. Um, I think where it gets a little bit tricky for myself is because I still work at the BBC as well. Um, and obviously we have to be impartial at the BBC, but fortunately because I don't go on the podcast, I, I'm in the back room, I edit it, I produce it, I can get around it. I think it would become a little bit trickier for me if I was doing the podcast, if I was if I was the person who was actually presenting it. So I, I just think, you know, for us, we, we believe in what we're putting out there. So we're happy for our names to be connected with. Um, and on my side, so I work within the School of Journalism and um, we actually have several outlets of publication. So the Community Podcast Initiative, we have our website, we have our series that come out with it. We also have the Calgary Journal and we have a human rights magazine called Article One. So we already have an established tradition within our university of having our own publications um, that the students do that we oversee and that we uh, are in control of that are independent from the university. So we're lucky in that sense that we have that established separation. But when you talk about, uh, Milan, the idea of you know, doxing or things that are, are being public, um, putting yourself out there and how that can come back in forms of online hate. It's something that we're having to think about often and often in context with our students. And sometimes it might not be a big article that they're doing, but you never know what's going to get some hate or get a bunch of attention. And uh, not only are our students vulnerable, but our female students are students from different racialized backgrounds. Um, you know, there are times we've, we've had discussions. I had a student a few years ago who did a piece um, about sort of a, a hidden uh, traveling sort of group of, of Muslim students that supported LGBTQ plus students in, in the city and she wanted to report on it, but she actually came to talk to me because she was worried that with her name associated with it, her family and her community may have a problem that, that she was reporting on this thing kind of in secret. And, and those are things that we have to work out together about, well, what might be the responses? How do you feel about this? What you know, supports can we provide as a university, but at the end of the day, if you're putting it out on your personal Twitter or X or whatever it is, you're going to be getting those messages. And so um, I think when we do that, it's reminding students that they have a right to not publish with a byline in some of those cases. Do they want to publish or how do they want to go about it and and to make those decisions? And because there's only so much protection we can provide. But what you mentioned, that idea of podcasts that don't have to be totally public, I think is something I've been thinking about a lot and I think is very important. I think particularly in in communities that want to tell stories or that need to share stories and information, those are places where they don't need the public to see it. They're not trying to justify it in any way. And so, you know, maybe it is about an internal podcast. Um, one of the ways I was talking recently, I think I mentioned the Sutina Nation that I, I've been doing some work with. So one of our Indigenous nations here in, in the area, um, they are sharing their knowledge and they want to share it publicly, but there's also certain stories that can only be shared certain times of year. There's certain pieces of information that can only be around at certain times. Well, that doesn't work if you publish a podcast and just leave it up. So what we did is I edited those pieces um, for them to share privately. They're going to have their own little internal network and choose to share with people at certain times of the year as they want to, but it's not for public consumption. And so I, I agree that there's I think part of when we're producing something is who are the audiences? Do they always need to go to everyone? And if not, then how can we just really serve our communities, whether it's from a safety or a content perspective, or just making sure that they're able to create better like contacts and connections with that information? I think that's a really beautiful example, Meg, of like what it looks like to have a kind of, it is not for everyone. Definitionally, it's like a, a podcast that's being used for a smaller group. The thing that I was thinking about, Milan, in answer to your question is, um, I, uh, I, so the, the labor union that is sort of at the center of the presentation that I gave um, started on Zoom necessarily because of the pandemic. And so one thing that people were always thinking about is like, how do you create a union culture in a context where people are not meeting physically because it's too dangerous? Um, and, you know, people are, are maybe in, they're not working from 
Charlottesville because they don't have to. Um, and the podcast emerged from that question because it was a way of saying, well, maybe we can use this sort of like, you know, digital space of the podcast to create a sense of what it is like to be in a room together, if only for the duration of that show. And, you know, it wasn't an unlisted private podcast, but I had serious doubts that anybody outside the union would be very interested in it simply because it's talking about fairly niche insular issues. And, and when you're sort of creating a podcast that's aimed as wide an audience as possible, you sometimes get into this lens of sort of oversimplifying or explaining things as if people don't know anything uh, about the issue, um, which is exactly what you want when you're listening to NPR in the car and trying to get up to speed on an issue that you're learning about. But um, but being able to say, okay, this is for a distinct group of people that is smaller than the general public, and that means we can speak in a certain way to one another. Um, I think that the notion of a, a totally private one, and I see Joe in the chat saying, um, there is such thing as a private podcast feed, but if it's online, I wouldn't be comfortable promising anyone it wouldn't get out, perhaps doing something at events or with community sharing, acknowledging the limitations. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, once it's on the internet, it's forever. That's that's what they say. You never know if some bad actor is going to take it and save it and use it to ruin your life. But um, but I think like, I, I like this idea that you're teasing out this sort of radical notion, as you put it, that um, maybe there's value in trying to conceive of like using this form as a, you know, a sum is dot, right? Passing it behind the back of um, the sort of large uh, forums of the internet and sharing it in a way that's more private. Um, to me, that's a really, that's a cool idea. That should, you should present on that next year at this symposium. Um, it is 6.30, we're 15 minutes over. Um, I don't get the sense that anyone is really desperate for us to stop talking, but but in being mindful of everyone's time and not not using the, the cudgel of politeness to prevent people from leaving and going to have dinner. Um, any burning questions that must be addressed? Anything anyone else would like to say? We got some, we got some things. Yeah, thank you guys for, for watching. Thanks, um, Meg and Carl and Benjamin, who's dispersed for, for being part of this. This was this was really fun to get to know you guys. And um, you know, thanks um for uh I guess we have Rebecca in the chat now as well as uh, as Mary Ellen for, for putting things behind the scenes and making this happen.